Massachusetts, which is in western Massachusetts, just a hop, skip, and a jump from Tanglewood. It's the largest collection and archive of Norman Rockwell paintings, studies, and photos, uh, second only to private collectors. Um, one of the things that we've done over the course of the last decade is we've also started to collect um, a collection of uh, American uh, illustration art. So other illustrators, um, our biggest uh, collection aside from Norman Rockwell is William Steig. Uh, I don't know if you're acquainted with William Steig. He was a cartoonist. Um, I don't know, I, th I think he did CDB. I don't know if anyone, if a little kid's book is called CDB. Um, anyway, um, one of the things that's interesting is that while, we, uh, while we're there, uh, we get about 150,000 visitors a year which, you know, compared to other venues, it's, it's not a lot. And so one of the things that we decided was to uh, develop a program of, uh, ex of touring exhibitions, not only Norman Rockwell exhibitions, but also American illustration art. And the reason being is that we know, being where we are, that not everyone is going to be able to make it to the Norman Rockwell Museum. And so we need to find ways of getting out there. So getting out there in one way is physically getting our paintings out there. The interesting thing is is that when you go to nrm.org, which is our website, uh, we have 500,000 online visitors uh, annually. And uh, we also have about 750,000 people who go to our store, uh, probably to buy prints and plates and all those things that people like to buy of Norman Rockwell. And we also have about 40,000 plus followers on social media. And what's interesting and, and why I came to the Norman Rockwell Museum was that not only did they want to try to find ways to build engagement in the museum, but also knowing that far more many people see Norman Rockwell online, they wanted to find and develop a plan for digital engagement and learning uh, online. So we have the sort of uh, typical things that you might find at a museum. We have an audio tour, but that's actually going to be re replaced with a digital tour. And it's a digital tour that's uh, compatible on, on a smartphone. So rather than having people rent out devices, um, we can actually tell them to go to explore.nrm.org and they can actually pull up the tour and they can actually explore that. And you can go to that too. One, one point of note is that we're still actually, we're releasing it in a couple weeks. So there are probably a couple bugs if you're using Android devices. It works pretty well on, on, on Apple. But the big deal here is that um, we didn't want to invest a ton of money in developing a mobile app an app that you have to actually physically install or digitally install on your phone, uh, mainly because that's prohibitively expensive. And oftentimes, once you develop it, uh, you often need to keep it up to date, especially as they update, uh, they provide updates for the phone. So we decided to make a mobile web app so that it could be compatible on web browsers on smartphones. And as long as we stay up to speed with those web browsers, uh, it's a much easier lift. We also have developed these interactive stations uh, in the museum. And what I want to point out is that we did this, but we actually did this reluctantly, um, mainly because in a similar case, we had board members who said, you really need a digital interactive at your museum. Um, and what we found is that more people actually enjoy looking at the paintings and actually sitting there and looking at the paintings. And you know, in the short time that I've been there, it's amazing to see little kids just sort of sit there and look at a painting and explore all the little things that are going on. But we built this digital interactive and it's, it's an interesting thing because um, once again, because I was involved with it, I didn't want to develop something that once we develop it, it then becomes obsolete and we can't grow it. And so this interactive is something that's fed by a web engine. Um, it is actually using um, what's you know, Adobe, Adobe Flash and Adobe Air, but it's all getting fed from uh, digital web content. So we can actually make changes to it. And it's a little bit easier to maintain and it's a little bit more dynamic. So it's not the same thing every time you go to it. 
One of the things that we, as I mentioned earlier, is that we have a very um, robust exhibition tour of, of content. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was f to come up with a way to replace the sort of traditional catalog that you get when you go to a museum. You know, they print out these really nice catalogs and they're really beautiful, but they're there and that's it. And then it's, you know, unless you really like those catalogs, they get stuck in a pile at home and they don't do much after that. So one of the things that we decided to do was to actually come up with a digital catalog that services both the in-venue experience but also can take that exhibition online. And so we did that with two um, exhibitions that we did over the course of the last year. We did one for Ross Chast. Ross Chast is a cartoonist for The New Yorker. Uh, and then we did another one for a very brief exhibition that we did at the UN. And we had to do one for that one because the UN really um, only paid to have the paintings that they wanted to have and they didn't really want to do anything else. And, but we felt that this was a tremendous opportunity for us and so we built a very simple one-page um, digital catalog and it's, it's designed with the intent to be really be used with a, a mobile device. Once again, I also want to point out that these are all web-driven and so uh, it gives us the opportunity to provide people who aren't going to go to those exhibitions to see that content <laughs> online. And, and as we've developed these, more and more content is getting placed on these, what I would call, exhibition websites. Um, initially when I did this, there was a lot of concern about putting too much content up there that nobody would come see us. Uh, and then what I found was that more content actually is better and more people ended up coming to see us. The interesting thing about the UN, and this is, and I'll be getting into this a little bit more, is that um, we actually produced a very uh, basic video about the conserving, uh, conservation of one of Norman Rockwell's drawings. And it was a drawing called, titled The United Nations. And it was done really on the cheap. It was a one person shoot. Uh, we didn't even have really good light um, and we didn't have very good audio, and so we actually had to go back a few times and, and, and produce this, this video, and this, actually, this video precedes me. But the interesting thing is, is that it caught the eye of the assistant to the Under Secretary General for the United Nations. And when he showed it to his boss, um, he then showed it to Ban Ki-moon, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations, and they said, we really need to get this at the United Nations. And then within the span of like two to three weeks, we, we went from not having an exhibition, not knowing that we were gonna be partnering with the UN to having an exhibition that was gonna run for two weeks or two months at the United Nations. And so just to illustrate a point, um, the video. My name is Leslie is Paisley. And I'm the paper conservator. I mean, it's it's good, and it's uh, at the you know it's Town pretty Art decent Foundation content, Center, but it's not like worked, Hollywood I production values. Out, it's been 20 years this year. The lab, uh, however, has been here since 1977. The original consortium consisted of just five museums, and we've now grown to about 55 museums that we serve throughout the New England and sort of Eastern Seaboard. What's wonderful about a collection like the Norman Rockwell Museum is to have a very vast and wide group of objects by a single artist because you do begin to understand their working technique and become familiar with their materials and the conditions so that when you see an object in good condition, you can then compare it to works, similar works from the same time period. This is a preliminary, fully worked up charcoal study, and it's full scale to the size of the painting that he would have executed. This is just his drawing to try out his images and make his composition and to get all of the tonal values correct before he moves on to the... If, if any of you are, are acquainted with Norman Rockwell, this was a drawing that he did 10 years before he painted The Golden Rule, and this was the inspiration for that painting. And so, as I, as I pointed out, this, was, this simple little video was what caught the eye of the UN, and then they wanted an exhibition. Um, what I will say is having an exhibition at the UN is really incredible. It's very prestigious. But if you've ever been to the UN, it's the security to get in the door, just to be in the lobby where our paintings were, um, is much more intense than going through a TSA checkpoint at the airport. So not a whole heck of a lot of people actually came 
to see the exhibition. Most of the people that saw it were actually people there because they were at the UN on business. And so we needed to find a way to kind of come up with a very simple way to, to get people aware of it. And this was it. This is a simple WordPress website that we made that just basically has information about the exhibition. Um, as I mentioned, it's a one page um, it's a one-page website that basically you just scroll through and you can hit the navigation and access content. And you can see information about the exhibition and all the information that led up to it. It's not rocket science and it actually garnered about 45,000 hits in the two months that we, we did it. Ross Chass came to the museum and, and this was just to have some levity. This was one of the illustrations that she had there. And, this is one that just people gravitated around. And it's interesting because it was like right next to a classic Norman Rockwell painting. So the other thing about the UN exhibition is that you never know what it's going to lead to. And um, after the exhibition was over, the UN had a very interesting request where they said, you can take all your paintings back, but could you keep the, the, um, the golden rule with us for a couple weeks? And we, we were like, Sure, why not, okay. And uh, it turns out there was a reason for it because this guy showed up and he wanted to have his picture taken next to the golden rule. And you can't buy that. <laughs> you can't buy that advertising. And after that picture hit the, the web, the interesting thing is that a lot of people thought that picture was taken at our museum. And uh, it wasn't, it was taken in the uh, conference room for Ban Ki-moon who's sitting on the right. But the moment that that went up, we had, I think, close to a million hits on Facebook and Twitter. And then, you know, we actually had a, it kicked off our fall season. And people were actually looking for the golden rule at the museum. They came to the museum. You know, we're not that far from New York City. And they came to the museum looking for the golden rule because they saw the Pope standing next to it. So. An interesting thing is that as we move forward with these exhibition websites, um, we're now working with some artists, living artists, who are going on exhibition. And this is an illustration by Jerry Pinckney. Um, I don't know if you're acquainted with him. He does a lot of illustrations, a lot for children's books. Um, and this is his illustration. It's an illustration for Sam and the Tigers, which is his, um, I will say, revisioning of Little Black Sambo. And it's an amazing, um, how shall I say it? It's an amazing thing because he really wanted people to see that you know there's a way where you can actually use art and you can spin a story and you can actually take something that has a fairly significant negative connotation and turn it into something that's a little bit more that's uplifting. And so what we did is we developed a, a, a whole um, website for his exhibition, which just opened last week. And the interesting thing here is that he wanted an audio tour. But we couldn't necessarily um, give him our audio tour because then it would be confusing. So we built a simple one once again with WordPress um, just to uh, provide him with something. And this is basically it. And he wanted to do a bunch of number of things. And this is, one of, this is an interesting thing is that he was sitting there going, this is probably going to be too expensive. I can't, we probably can't afford to do this. Uh, but let's, if you can do it, you know, and, and my, my mantra now, or my motto at the at the museum, is like, well, let's try it and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, then my thing is, is that let's not invest so much time and money into it that we can't go into it and actually make changes and tweak it. So we came up with this digital tour. Um, it has um, it features approximately uh, 20 of his illustrations from 20 of his books. And so he did one for uh, he did an audio. Um, commentary, so analogous to a, a, an audio tour, and you know he curated. He wanted music, so we came, we came up with a, a simple audio segment that people could listen to while they are um, going on tour. And he curated all the music. If I, and then he talks about his work on the Ugly Duckling. And as you're looking at it, you can actually look at the images. And the whole point of this here is that, obviously, if you're at the exhibition, you don't need to look at these images because you can just look at them on the wall. But this gives us an opportunity to, um, for people who aren't going to make it to the exhibition to see the work 
and um, and experience the exhibition as if they were there. And it's free, which makes it even better. Um, once again, it's just a web-based uh, application that we made. And, and what I'll just point out, and, and for many of you, I know this isn't probably new, um, but for some of you, it may be. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I talked to a number of people last night at the, at the reception, and they're doing so many amazing things that this may be old hat. But long story short is that um, when I started at the museum, I said I wanted to create a sandbox where we could play and do things. And I didn't want to make it a significant investment. So to convince them, we just bought a $7.99 a month hosting package with GoDaddy. We set up WordPress, and then I set up WordPress as a multi-site WordPress. And that simply just means that with a click of a button, I can create a new website. Um, and what's, what's amazing about it is that we've gone, the museum itself has gone from working on these long projects with a lot of human and financial investment and time investment. Um, and then, you know, when they build the project, it sort of sits there and lays dormant because they don't want to go back and, and touch it lest they break it. So now we've gotten out of that rut and now we're building new in initiatives. And in this particular situation, we're doing it with WordPress, but we've also started doing it with other platforms and frameworks. So the other thing I would just say is that, you know, be nimble. You know, if it doesn't work, it's it's the digital world. You can make changes as many times as you like and be willing to experiment and above all measure what you're doing. You know, use something like Google Analytics, which is free, to measure what people are doing, and then from that you can see how you need to make improvements or changes or nothing at all. The other thing I wanted to just sort of talk briefly about was just that um, you know, having these Websites are great for exhibitions, but it still requires you to market people to build awareness that think that's where they need to go. So another important thing, equally important thing, uh, especially with digital engagement, is to get your content where the people are. And so what we've done is we've put a fair amount of content uh, onto Google Art Project of Norman Rockwell's work. Um, you know, there was a lot of concern about putting this up there because people thought we were selling the farm, putting up these images, and people could actually download the images and make mugs and t-shirts and stuff like that. But when, in fact, um, you know, the folks at Google are really great about protecting your, your content. And so all of our content is embedded. So it doesn't necessarily prohibit someone from making a postcard or doing something, but it does reduce the chances that people are going to do something bad. It doesn't eliminate it. But the pros definitely outweigh the cons. This is something that was something I was feeling very strongly about, is that um, part of the Google project is called uh, the Google Cultural Institute, where you can create virtual exhibitions. And um, working with Google, they asked us if we would create an exhibition for African American History Month, which starts in a, uh, next week, uh, focusing on Rockwell's work around civil rights. And so, and, and, and not too many people are aware that he did a lot of work around civil rights. Um, it's actually a very interesting thing, is that his whole life working for the Saturday Evening Post, um, he painted a lot of interesting things and provided a lot of what I would call integration in his paintings, but it was the editors of the Saturday Evening Post who would strategically crop his paintings so that they were less diverse. Um, and it wasn't until 63 um, um, that uh, he moved away from the Saturday Post, lost me. Uh, but I'll talk loudly. And he worked at, uh, at Look Magazine, in which case he then decided to change gears completely and all of his content was focused on control, uh, on, on civil rights, on cultural sort of integration, and, and sort of building awareness around the, the problems that were going on in the country. So we built this, um, this exhibition, which isn't quite live yet, but I'll just sort of show you um, an example of what it is. So it's a simple tool that uh, Google created, and what you do is you upload all your assets to Google, you encode it with all the metadata that you want to have to protect it, as well as to define what people are looking at, and then you effectively cre curate your own exhibition. And so we, we did this uh, around the content, um, showing, and what we try to do is to show not only focusing on the content, but also the process.
showing what Norman Rockwell did to make the paintings. So you can come in here and you can get a little background on what, he's, what, what some of these things are. This is a painting he did called Murder in Mississippi. I think maybe one out of maybe 100 people that I talked to actually know that he painted this. And it actually depicts the murder of the three um, civil rights uh, workers, uh, people who went down to Mississippi to get people to register to vote. And so he painted this, and not too many people know that. And, and it's, it's a pretty stark image when you go there. When you look at, think of Norman Rockwell, you think of all these really beautiful, colorful paintings. This was painted in brown, white, and red. So that's, that's what he, you know, he wanted to show how stark it was. He talked about, he also showed about the integration of neighborhoods in Chicago. And obviously, if you're not acquainted with this, this is a, a painting he called, he titled The Problem We All Live With which is the desegregation of schools in New Orleans, and this is Ruby Bridges, depicting Ruby Bridges walking to school, escorted by US Marshals. And this is the painting. And you know, we've in, we created some very basic videos that people can go in and watch uh, that talk about the painting. And this one is with our chief curator, um, which I can't really fast forward it because I don't want to mess with the... Very important painting in um, Norman Rockwell's career, which is called The Problem We All Live With. It's actually a 1964 illustration. And as you can see, and, um, not super high production value, but the important point is the content and what you're delivering. So what's really interesting is that now you can actually go in and start looking at the painting and exploring the painting. And then you can do things like see, you know, like start off with the actual painting. Um, and you can zoom in um, to a certain extent, and then you can actually go in and then see. Here's a, a here is a photograph of a study that he did, and what you'll, what's interesting to see here is that when he went from, and I'll just a little brief thing because it's interesting to me and may be interesting to you, is that for his entire life he painted for the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, so it's just a simple, um, you know, vertical painting. But when he went to Look, he actually became the artist for the centerfold of Look magazine. And so when you open up a magazine, you have the gutter in the middle. And so he had to strategically place where the subject matter would be. And so when he first painted this painting, he put ruby bridges on the right side of the gutter. But for him, it didn't work for him because it made it look like she was um, being passive or, or even somewhat intimidated. And he wanted to show a stronger um, uh, embodiment of, of Ruby. So what he did, and this is what he did, is that he would actually cut up what he did and kind of do his own photoshopping and with, with glue and paper or whatnot. And he moved her to the left side, and that's basically how it transformed into what, what we see today. What's interesting is that this exhibition, although it's not ready for it, um, Jessica talked about the Oculus Rift experience where you put on the goggles and you can see stuff. Well, Google is making all these tools available and they're making it so that people don't have to be high-end developers to do neat things. And so many of the exhibitions that you see on the Cultural uh, Institute utilize Google Cardboard, which is just a simple piece of cardboard that you can, you know, you can buy this and it's three or four dollars online or they actually, on Google, they give you a little blueprints where you can actually make your own. And then what it is, is it's a simple, de simple device where you take your phone, you stick your phone in there, and now you have a 3D viewer uh, of video. And so the content that you produce uh, with Google Culture Institute can be uh, automatically set up to be viewed on Google Cardboard. So for little or no money, you've gone from having like nothing to a number of tools at your disposal to, to really make things happen. Um, one other thing that we posted on here is that, uh, as I mentioned, we have the archives of Norman Rockwell. So he got a lot of correspondence in, his, in the course of his life. And it was interesting that some of the most um, intense feedback he got was obviously through uh, his work uh, working on these paintings. And so you can actually go through and read some of the commentary by people who said, this is amazing, you're doing great work, to you're a propaganda artist, you're, 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 you know, you're evil, you're vile, whatever. 
And so it's an interesting thing to read these things. I mean, one person was so moved by it in a positive way that he wrote a four-page poem that you can read. So it's an interesting little thing. The Google Cultural Institute doesn't have to be just for art museums. It can be used for any type of cultural activity. So it can be used for historical purposes, or it could be for geographic or cultural purposes. So you can go in and explore um, um, various, item, uh, various places, or you can learn about things in history like the suffragette movement. Um, as I mentioned, when I first proposed doing this, everybody, including the Norman Rockwell family, was, thought I was insane because they thought, we're going to put this up there and nobody's going to want to either come to the museum or everyone's going to steal everything willy-nilly and then what's the point? What's the point of coming to the museum? Because they can just you know, have it on their computer. But the fact of the matter is, is that when you do something like this, it generates a ton of exposure for you. Um, for example, uh, when it was the 50th anniversary of the, the, um, the moment in history where, where Ruby Brown went to school, they put up this painting and, um, and then uh, Barack Obama was like, you know, I really would like to have a copy of that painting in the White House. And so we gave him a, a, a museum quality print to put up in the, in, in the White House. And that one little thing triggered a ton of, of interest in the Norman Rockwell Museum. And today, it's kind of funny. We do all these great things and that one post that we have on our site is the thing that every day gets at least 100 times more traffic than anything else we do. So it's amazing what you can do with just one little thing. So I'm, I'm here to talk a little bit today about user-generated content, or UGC. And that just simply means is that uh, people on social media will post their content uh, that's either uh, a tribute to or in, in criticism of things that you do. And Norman Rockwell is one of the most memed artists uh, on social media. So as you can see here, um, DC Comics decided to meme uh, Rockwell's uh, painting uh, Freedom From Want. Um, Norman Rockwell comes up, if you do a Google, I have a Google alert on Norman Rockwell, and it's amazing what I get. And this one here where it says, if my family could be more Norman Rockwell and less Norman Bates, that would be great. Um, <laughs> and then this last one is actually taking that problem we all live with and it was in response to the violence in Baltimore um, last year. And a gentleman by the name of Pops Peterson decided to actually take imagery from uh, the aftermath of Baltimore and, and put it in the background with Ruby Bridges or Norman Rockwell's Ruby Bridges on the front. And that was, that had just generated a ton of, of, of discussion. And that's what we like to do discussion. So, as I mentioned, we do a lot of touring. We're going to be doing, in a couple years, an exhibition on our four freedoms. So these are paintings that Norman Rockwell did in response to uh, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, speech about the four freedoms. And at the time, right before World War II, these were a huge hit. I mean, huge hit. Uh, so much so that the Treasury Department asked to work with Norman Rockwell and the Saturday Evening Post to go on tour to sell war bonds of paintings the copies of his paintings uh, in, in order to raise war bonds. And so we're going to put this exhibition out there uh, in, in, in response to the 75th anniversary of Rockwell's Four Freedoms. Now, one of the things you might notice is that there's not a whole heck of a lot of diversity in his paintings. So one of the challenges that we find that we're going to have is obviously making these paintings relevant to a wide swath of people. And so the way we're going to do that is through you know the usual things like a traditional museum exhibition. Uh, we'll have symposia that talk about freedom, but where it's all going to happen is a year prior to the start of the exhibition, we're going to be doing a whole curriculum initiative and a social media campaign around the interpretation of freedom. So, what is your interpretation of freedom today? Or uh, one thing that seems to have some resonance with people is, what is your fifth freedom? And so what we want to do is we want to be able to grab that information from people through social media and use that content to create a conversation, to create a conversation around the relevance of what the paintings are about, the paintings of the interpretation of freedom. 
in a visual way. And so what we're going to do is we'll have a call for art that will be with traditional artists, but we're also going to do a call for art from students, K through 12, as well as general public to post their content online and use a cash tag campaign so that we can track what those people are doing. And then what we can do is as we see stuff coming in, we can curate that content and bring that into our, our website as onto our social media platforms. As well as um, what's going to be interesting is we're actually going to bring this into the exhibition itself. So the exhibition is a series of rooms that progresses over time. And the last room is simply the interpretation of freedom today. And it's all the user generated content that comes from what people have generated over the course of the year. Uh, and another thing that we're, we're playing around with is the concept of live freedom every day. So how many of you are acquainted with StoryCorps, where people on NPR, where people give their stories? So what we're thinking of doing is setting up these little pop-up places, right, in museums and in, in venues, in, in cultural or public venues, where people can go in, and it's almost like a photo booth, and they can tell their story about what freedom means to them. And then we will do something similar to the hashtag campaign where we'll aggregate that content and it will provide us with an opportunity to have people talk. And it provides an opportunity for people then to know that this is online, but I can also go to X Museum and see myself in an exhibition. Um, other things that we're thinking about doing, so one thing I did mention is that, so the four freedoms are on view at the Norman Rockwell Museum and they have been, we don't put them on tour because they're kind of like our anchor store. It's like they're, they're the uh, marquee paintings for the museum. And so if we take them out of the museum, we're concerned that there may be uh, not too much inspiration for people to come to the museum. So this is actually going to be a tour uh, to only six or seven venues in the country and possibly abroad. And what we want to do is we want to actually take the social media campaign and actually break, pull it in with all of our, our venue partners so that they share in the wealth of information that can get generated from the campaign. So this is just an example of, you know, I just sort of used um, uh, what's called a hashtag aggregator called Tagboard, and I did a hashtag uh, search on high school art. And basically, it just gave me with a ton of content of uh, students posting their art online. And it posted it in a very unique way where you can actually see what the photo is and what they might have posted along with it. And what the benefit of this is that you can actually choose to actually sh show it as is, or if you have some concerns around, you know, some people might push the envelope of what's um, legitimate or, uh, uh, I mean, let's just put it this way, you, you can have the opportunity where if someone's putting something in the libel that's up online, you can actually take it down. Um, so there are ways that you can manage that and curate that. This is an interesting thing. This is actually a heat map of tweets after uh, the Charlie Hebdo uh, attacks, where people said it should just be Charlie Hebdo. And this is the, a heat map of, of the tweets where people had put that in the hashtag. And what we're thinking about doing with this campaign is that as people are generating their own content and contributing it back into our campaign, it's to provide a real-time mechanism for people to actually see how they get to look at the data uh, of how people are, are interacting with us and to sort of get a pulse of what people are thinking and what they're talking about and creating that not only online but as also part of that last room of the exhibition. This is an example of the Live Freedom Every Day where we could pull in all these people talking and we could have a room where um, you know people could go in there and they could literally go up to the screen and touch a person's face and you get to hear what they're saying. Um, what I'll just say about this is that user-generated user content can be really valuable in terms of cultivating uh, new audiences. Um, and one thing I will say, uh, as we're not quite ready, not yet going into the execution phase of this exhibition, is that um, when you start talking about this to sponsors and partners, they go gaga for it because they know there's so much data that you can find out about the people who are participating, that it becomes such a valuable asset for you that they're willing to become partners with you. Um, partners, so museums. So um, we have an agreement with the Miami-Dade College Museum of Art and Design. I, think, I don't know if I got that right. But they're going to be having the exhibition. 
here. And um, you know, we're looking forward to being able to share uh, the data that we have from this campaign with them because we feel that it could become a great opportunity for continuing the conversation well after the exhibition is over. Um, so that's that's basically it. I think that's that's it for me. So thank you. Thank you.